We are on. Good morning uh, and good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are, as uh, Fred mentioned earlier. My name is Mamou Katsereteli. I'm senior fellow at Central Asia Caucasus Institute. And uh, we have a special session today of uh, our forum. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, international mediation of Kazakhstan, uh, history that uh, uh, this country uh, accumulated in the last uh, several decades in international mediation. Uh, we have, uh, usually our institute covers uh, obviously some geopolitical issues, larger issues that are visible uh, on uh, international affairs, but sometimes there are many details and many interesting developments that are not as visible in uh, in arena of international relations. And uh, I think this, uh, this experience of Kazakhstan in international mediation is one of those. And our institute tries to cover those uh, kind of developments, finding uh, interesting roles that the countries in our region uh, find themselves um, uh, to, uh, to uh, present themselves as leaders uh, in many occasions. And Kazakhstan is a good example of that. We have excellent lineup of speakers. Uh, Ambassador Kajukhanov is, uh, thank you for hosting us at uh, your embassy. Uh, and the uh, embassy is co co one of the co-hosts of this, um, uh, of this uh, uh, forum today. Uh, thank you and thank your capable staff for supporting and helping us with this. Uh, Ambassador Kajukhano has uh, uh, many years of experience in diplomacy. He served as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador to United Kingdom, and uh, he's a very capable Ambassador of Kazakhstan in the United States for the last several years. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Fred Starr he needs no introduction. He's a, a, a most probably eminent uh, scholar of Central Asia, author of many books, including Lost Enlightenment. And he's working on a new book uh, now, which will be out soon, I hope. Uh, and Fred can mention this uh, in his uh, brief presentation. Obviously, our main presenter today, author of the study on Kazakhstan's international mediation is Dr. Swante Cornell, who will be uh, presenting next after uh, Dr. Starr, presenting the main findings of the study. And uh, we are very fortunate and honored by the presence of David Merkel, uh, a longtime friend of our institute, but also uh, uh, somebody with a great experience and, uh, uh, and uh, expertise in the field of international relations, uh, former uh, National Security uh, Council executive, former uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of uh, Treasury, uh, and currently in the board of Nazarbayev University in, in, in Kazakhstan. So uh, I think we could not get, a, get better speakers today to discuss this issue without further delay. Uh, um, sorry, uh, Dr. Starr, I would like you to start. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All new sovereignties are not the same the basic principle. It's easy to compare them and draw <clears throat> as the conclusions that because they're new sovereignties, they, they must behave in certain generic ways. Well, this isn't, wasn't the case from the beginning. In, uh, And shortly, really shortly after uh, independence, Pre President Nazarbayev proposed, took an initiative that was not reactive, uh, dealing with the uh, uh, existing nuclear problem, but was absolutely out into the, into the blue, and that was his Conference on Confidence Building Measures in Asia. He proposed that at the UN, at, at the United Nations in October 92. It, it took six years before it was actually actually implemented with a conference initially of deputy foreign ministers, but over time, because they pursued it so consistently and steadily, uh, the Kazakhs established their conference on confidence building measures as a significant part of the international machinery of, 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 of peace. Now, it's against that background that this 
issue that we're addressing today uh, comes up. That, namely, for, that President Nazarbayev, from the very beginning, saw a role for mediation. This is a very interesting idea. We'll discuss it at length. But the idea that a newly sovereign state with a, with a small population, huge territory, but small population, could somehow, uh, th that its head of chief of state could somehow play a role in, in, in big issues of international relations as a mediator, this was really something quite new. And, and I want to stress, it, it started actually before independence. In uh, September 1991, uh, 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 it was already underway in shuttle diplomacy involving uh, 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 Karabakh and the Armenian problem. It, the, it emerged again, this idea of Kazakhstan as a mediator uh, during the Kyrgyz crisis of 2010, and then again uh, in a most unexpected way with the Iranian nuclear uh, issue. It should have been expected because after all, <laughs> Kazakhstan had legitimacy as a country that had given up nuclear arms. Um, the Russia-Ukrainian issue was another case where, where uh, mediation was initiated on the, uh, from, from the capital of Kazakhstan. The Islamic reconciliation discussions, and this is very bold concept, uh, uh, but why not? And, and to their credit, uh, the government of Kazakhstan uh, uh, initiated th this process and, and carried it forward. And then finally, I should mention the, the last two, the, the 2016, the, the Turkey-Russia mediation at, at a very complicated moment and, and uh, Kazakhstan with close links on both sides was able to play a role as a mediator. And then in the Syrian civil war, uh, uh, where once again, this effort was, was launched. Now, not all these, all these initiatives were successful. You will hear about that from, from Dr. Cornell. Uh, but what's interesting and the question we must ask is how, what is the relationship of this mediation role to the so-called multi-vectored foreign policy that was initiated in the in the 90s. Uh, by the way, multi-vectored is a term in algebra. It, it was applied, it was, I think it was, it was uh, then Foreign Minister Takayev who, who applied it for the first time in, in the diplomatic world. But be that as it may, the one thing that we can be absolutely certain about is that the Kazakhstan's initiatives, many initiatives in the sphere of of mediation, uh, uh, some successful, some less so. That these were the uh, these were the work of the first president Nazarbayev. Uh, it, it, uh, it it's worth pointing this out. Uh, it's a simple historical fact, but I think we should also uh, give uh, former president, first president. Nazarbayev full credit for it and and salute him on his 80th birthday, which is just taking place. Um, the question that I leave you with is this, what's the future of the, this mediation role? Uh, the, at one level, you can ask, is it a personal issue? Does the, the uh, President Takaya fully engage with it? it? Does it suit his temperament and, and inclinations and his understanding of, of strategy? Uh, and or will it will it continue? And if so, will there be any changes and shifts and so forth? Uh, but let me let me acknowledge in conclusion that this is a very innovative way of of managing geopolitical competition and for enabling a small state with a small population to play a useful and productive role, which actually and this is my firm personal judgment, actually reinforces sovereignty and independence of Kazakhstan itself. So with that, let me turn to Dr. Svante Cornell. 
Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador, for hosting us and for, uh, for uh, the discussions we've had with you and with other Kazakh diplomats who have been involved directly in these efforts uh, during the preparation of this study. Uh, I will also try to be brief since we have us both, we want to hear from you and from David and from our audience. Uh, but I'd say that the, uh, the several aims of this study, the first was to probe deeper into the issue and provide what we felt was missing, namely a full accounting of the different mediation efforts that Kazakhstan has undertaken. You can find instances here and there about it, but no comprehensive study. Uh, and second, to derive the answer to some questions. For example, what were the goals of Kazakhstan's initiatives? What did it achieve? And as Professor Starr uh, already raised, what is the future of it? So I will only speak briefly of the processes themselves. So we have a study that is online now. The uh, full links will be distributed to everybody who, uh, who have attended this and will be on our websites. Uh, Professor Starr mentioned them already, but I think it's important to note that it started already uh, this is uh, in the last days of the Soviet Union. While we have most of Kazakhstan's serious initiatives in the past decade, it really has been an element throughout the, the, the period of Kazakhstan's independence. Uh, obviously, the first attempt did not work. It was a joint effort of mediation together with Boris Yeltsin at a time when the parties were simply not ready for peace. And then, of course, we had the OSCE step in with the pluses and minuses of that, which we can all discuss at another occasion. Uh, it's also important to mention that Kazakhstan also played a role in seeking to mediate the, the civil war in Tajikistan. It was not the lead in, in this effort, but it was one among many countries to include, uh, to include Russia, Iran, and others uh, that hosted uh, rounds of talks in Almaty in 1994 in the case of uh, the Kazakh effort, which, in which uh, current President Tokayev played a very direct role, I believe, as at that time Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, for some time after that, in the late 1990s and the 2000s, Kazakhstan's diplomacy really focused on building, it seems to me, its role in multilateral institutions, which is an issue on which we published another study uh, a few years ago, uh, together with Yuan Engval, which is called Asserting Sovereignty, Kazakhstan's uh, Role in International Organizations. Uh, and in a sense, we view that as a stepping stone for the role uh, that Kazakhstan has in, in, the, in the field of mediation. As Professor Starr mentioned, the, the crisis in Kyrgyzstan in 2010, which happened to co coincide with Kazakhstan's presidency of the OSCE, was a place where Kazakhstan really played what we find to be an underestimated role in preventing a major escalation of the internal troubles in, in Kyrgyzstan by taking away President Bakiyev, the ousted President Bakiyev from, from the south of the country where he had ensconced himself together with his supporters. Uh, this was a very, very sensitive time when people in the north of, of Kyrgyzstan were understandably very upset by the violence and bloodshed that had uh, happened when President Bakiyev tried to remain in power. And there was a movement organized to try to move down to the south of Kyrgyzstan and to physically confront him and apprehend him. Of course, as we know, uh, uh, ethnic riots between Kyrgyz and Uzbeks took place in the south of, of Kyrgyzstan that June. I think uh, it's only a question of a little bit of imagination to imagine what would have happened if President, former President Bakiyev had still been there and you would have had an intra-Kyrgyz component to the struggle as well, which could have been an existential issue for the state of Kyrgyzstan, I would say. Um, of course, uh, Kazakhstan was lucky enough uh, and astute enough perhaps to ensure that Mr. Bakiev didn't remain in Taras, but was airlifted out to Belarus where he remains to this day. Um, and I think the, it is after this event that we really see the, uh, the picking up of speed of Kazakhstan's initiatives. And uh, the nuclear issue, of course, is uh, a major one. Kazakhstan already in 2009 had proposed to host the International Atomic Energy Agency's nuclear fuel bank, which after many years actually became a reality. Uh, so it had raised its, its for, for many years, of course, it's, uh, as many Americans who have been involved in this would know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, its role in, in, in nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, but in 2013, it hosted two rounds of talks in Almaty on the Iranian nuclear program with every involved party. Uh, they did not achieve any concrete results, but it is absolutely clear that without these talks in Almaty, there would have been very little chance for the, uh, for the negotiations in Geneva that eventually led to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. I know that there are different, uh, and for good reason, different opinions about the validity of and the terms of that agreement, but nevertheless, 
this was an important uh, contribution by Kazakhstan to the uh, to this process. Um, very soon thereafter, uh, the Ukraine crisis breaks out in 2014, which was a very sensitive issue for Kazakhstan for a number of reasons, primarily, of course, because of its close ties to Russia, uh, uh, but also because of Kazakhstan's own concern about the uh, rise of ethno-nationalism and obviously what the risk of ideas like Novorossiya could mean for Kazakhstan itself in the future. So it was uh, viewed as imperative by the Kazakhstani leadership to, uh, to, uh, to seek to, uh, as much as possible, uh, reduce the intensity of this conflict and maintain a dialogue both between Russia and Ukraine and between Russia and the West. And for example, uh, although none of the actual big summits of, uh, of this conflict to, to deal with this conflict happened in, in, in Kazakhstan, President Nazarbayev played an absolutely critical role. Uh, I think any, any deeper uh, inquiry into this uh, period will find that in, um, in maintaining uh, the, the, the dialogue between Russia and Ukraine, for example, by, by ensuring that the, the first meeting between the Eurasian Customs Union and the new Ukrainian leadership actually took place. And second, for example, in keeping alive uh, dialogue between Western powers and Russia on the issue, a few months later, when President Hollande of France was visiting Kazakhstan, uh, President Nazarbayev organized for his uh, spontaneous trip to Moscow on the way back to, to Europe, at which a certain level of dialogue was kept alive, which was on the breaking point at this, uh, at the, in this situation. Um, Kazakhstan continues to offer to uh, play a role in, in taking this process uh, further, and we will see perhaps following the pandemic, if there are ways to build on the current ceasefire in the Ukraine conflict that has been holding for, uh, for much longer than has been previously the case. Um, very soon after this, uh, we moved to the confrontation between Turkey and Russia, following the shootdown of a uh, Russian plane over the Turkey-Syrian border, which had led to uh, a deep rupture in these relations with Russian sanctions on Turkey and so forth. Again, in Turkey and Russia are powers that uh, Kazakhstan both uh, has very close relations with, and Kazakhstan took an active role in trying to, um, to find a formula for, should we say, uh, President Erdogan of Turkey to issue a semi-apology to, uh, to, to President Putin that would allow a normalization of these relations. We have all the details in, in, in the actual paper about how this happened during a summit in Tashkent where planes were first not allowed to land, but finally allowed to land to hand deliver this letter and so forth. It, uh, if you could, you could actually probably make a movie out of it. We didn't, but somebody else might. Um, building on all of these, I think um, you see the context of how the Astana talks in Syria came about, because obviously they were very complex. They involved uh, obviously the uh, several, not all, but several of the parties to the Syrian conflict. Uh, the Syrian regime was there, certain opposition groups were there, but of course not the jihadi forces. And importantly, also the Kurdish uh, groups in Syria were also not represented because of Turkish opposition. And these talks involved, beside the United Nations, also Turkey, Russia, and Iran. And obviously, to, Kazakhstan became an, an, an accepted interlocutor for all of these parties, and especially for the regional powers, not least because it had already proven its ability to function as a mediator with the Almaty talks with Iran in 2013 and between Turkey and Russia only, only very recently. And that helped uh, make Kazakhstan the, the natural go-to country for, for this initiative. Now, um, moving on from, from this uh, very brief overview, I think a couple of questions, what, what can we conclude from them? Looking at all these cases and comparing them, I think it, there are several things that stand out. Uh, the first is that Kazakhstan has tended to intervene in conflicts that it felt affected the security of its own region, either by having a direct potential effect on Kazakhstan itself or on the relations among the great powers that in turn are crucial to the country's security. So for example, getting involved in Nagorno-Karabakh in 1991 makes sense because ethno-nationalism uh, as evidenced in the Caucasus at the time posed a serious threat for a multi-ethnic country like Kazakhstan. And therefore, the attempt to try to cool down that conflict made a lot of sense. In regards to Tajikistan and to Kyrgyzstan, it's very obvious that these are neighbors of Kazakhstan that have a direct effect on its security. And I think with, with the case of Ukraine, you could say the same thing. 
that the rise of Russian ethno-nationalism in the Ukrainian context was something that was potentially detrimental to Kazakhstan's own stability. Uh, the Iranian nuclear program had more to do with Kazakhstan's own interest in, 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 in the nuclear issue because of its own nuclear history. And even in Syria, you could talk about an interest in trying to address a conflict that had a limited but very real attraction to a small portion of the Kazakh youth, as in the rest of Central Asia and in Europe and elsewhere in the Middle East where people uh, went to fight in this conflict. So that is the aspect of securing, uh, so to speak, Kazakhstan's own sovereignty. Second, there is a, a very clear and perhaps most importantly, a, an ambition to manage the great power relationships surrounding Central Asia. In the case of the Iranian nuclear issue, um, I think it's clear that Kazakhstan sought to avoid a major military conflagration in its very close neighborhood that would have pitted various great powers against each other. In the case of Turkey and Russia, it's the same thing to try to fix uh, or address the relationships between uh, two powers that are important for Kazakhstan's economy and for its foreign policy. Uh, with regard to, uh, to Syria, Kazakhstan clearly had an, an interest in, in minimizing the, the conflict or potential escalation of, of disagreements between Turkey, Russia, and Iran, all of which uh, could have spread way beyond the Syrian conflict and thus created problems in Central Asia as well. So it seems to me that the Kazakh activism and mediation to a large degree is driven is driven by an urge to manage this great power relationship. Uh, now, many people could say, could look at Kazakhstan's interventions in Ukraine, in Syria, uh, elsewhere, and say, well, none of these issues, the Sir Syrian civil war, the Iranian nuclear issue, or, the, uh, or the, uh, the Ukraine conflict have really been resolved. But I think it's clear that Kazakhstan always had a realistic approach to how much it could do to actually resolve these very deep and very serious protracted conflicts, but that it could address and manage the great power politics surrounding them to help avoid the escalation and spread of these conflicts and to contribute to countering their further escalation. And in that sense, uh, a clear purpose of this was to strengthen Kazakh sovereignty by having an impact on the international and geopolitical environment. And most importantly, it seems to me, uh, this uh, activism on the part of Kazakhstan has, a, has the effect of convincing all great powers, and perhaps particularly Russia, that they all have an interest in Kazakhstan maintaining its independence and sovereignty in order to be able to function as an honest broker and as a mediator that is useful for all of these great powers. In other words, that Kazakhstan is more useful as an independent actor than as somebody who is just a supporting actor, bandwagoning, if you will, to the, to the interests or, or policies of one or another of the bigger powers. And this, of course, in a time of, of that I think leaders in Central Asia, certainly in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, have identified as a period of serious um, uh, instability on the Eurasian continent, and particularly surrounding Central Asia, is a way of further building sovereignty in a time of troubles. Now, I will close only on a few words on looking forward um, and, and, and ask what the future of this is. And I'm eager, obviously, to hear Ambassador Kazakhanov and and David Merkel's views on this as well. Uh, but as Fred raised the question is, um, what is the uh, future of Kazakhstani initiatives where we have uh, a history of these initiatives that are so clearly uh, connected to the personality of President Nazarbayev? Uh, gradually, of course, President Nazarbayev has left the post of president and will, uh, over time, uh, assumedly uh, further reduce his footprint, if you will, although in the short term, he, he may actually have more time for international mediation because he's not into the day-to-day -day politics of the country. Uh, and personalities certainly matter in the issues uh, that Kazakhstan is involved in, but it seems to me that we're dealing with a, a, a situation where uh, Kazakhstan has a serious potential to continue to play this role in the future for several reasons. The first is to look at, if we focus continued on personalities, that the successor to President Nazarbayev is not a person who has been heavily involved in economic affairs, in the healthcare sector, or what you would expect in, in many Western countries, but somebody with a very strong foreign policy profile, uh, not only having served as prime minister and foreign minister, but as head of the United Nations organizations in Geneva, which shows that if you wanted somebody in the Kazakhstani elites to take over, that would be the ideal person to continue to be able to play a role in international mediation. You couldn't do better than, than, than Kasim Jamar Tokayev. 
who has his own connections and his own relations and will uh, very likely be able to continue to play a similar role in the future. Uh, but equally important, I think, is the, the meritocratic approach to Kazakhstan's foreign service, which differs very much. For example, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Lavrov has been foreign minister for 16 years. Other countries in the region have similarly long serving tenures for their, for their foreign policy leaders. What we see in Kazakhstan is that a number of people, present company included, uh, have served in very high positions, including ministerial positions, and rotated out of those and continue to serve their country in various capacities, which means that both at the senior level of the foreign service and also at the mid, mid level, there is not only a small handful of people who have, uh, who have experience of international mediation and activity in, the, in, in multilateral organizations and very serious issues, but a rather large group on which Kazakhstan, of course, can build in the future. Uh, finally, of course, I think the, uh, this is the supply side. Uh, so we may all be supporters of supply side economics or not, but, but international mediation is a demand driven issue. If there is no demand, there will be no mediation. And a broader, I think, analysis of the strategic situation surrounding Central Asia does not suggest that we're likely to have fewer uh, issues that require mediation in the future. I think if anything, we are likely to have more. Uh, many countries like my own country of Sweden or Finland or Switzerland or other small neutral European countries that have previously played such central roles, I should mention Norway, of course, uh, in, the, in international mediation, uh, may not have the same ability to, to both the level of analysis and relationships with uh, great powers like Turkey, China, Russia, for, or for that matter, Iran, that will be required to play a role in managing the conflicts surrounding Central Asia in the future. And therefore, it seems to me, uh, Mr. Ambassador, that the demands for your country services will, will continue. And I'll stop Thank here. you. Thank you. Ambassador, please. Thank you, Dr. Ceratelli, dear ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is a great honor to welcome uh, Professor Fred Starr and Svante Cornell, the co-authors of the report uh, uh, on international mediation under the leadership of uh, President Nazarbayev. And I would like to say that uh, on the 1st of December, we marked the presidential date that directly linked with the leadership and the role of the founding father of independent Kazakhstan, President Sultan Nazarbayev. I would like to once again thank the authors, and uh, it is very well written report. Uh, uh, it will uh, receive a positive feedback uh, uh, from the general audience and from the expert community. I want to briefly uh, touch upon a few uh, points that was mentioned in the report and already mentioned by my colleagues here. Uh, first uh, is the um, Kazakhstan's role in nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. You know that uh, Kazakhstan has voluntarily renounced its fourth largest nuclear arsenal in the beginning of 19th, joining the NPT in 93 as a non-nuclear state. And uh, a very bold move uh, made by President Nazarbayev at the beginning of independence, uh, closing by his degree the former nuclear testing site in Semipalatinsk. And we sincerely believe that it paved the way to the uh, signing and adoption of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty that has been uh, signed in uh, 96 uh, uh, after, after uh, the closure or, and moratorium on nuclear tests. Kazakhstan initiated um, uh, the, promo, uh, the 29th of August, the date uh, of the closure of simple Latinx as a day of International Day Against Nuclear Tests which uh, was widely supported by the United Nations. Uh, Kazakhstan was behind the establishment of the nuclear weapon-free zone in um, Central Asia, the only nuclear weapon-free zone in the Northern hem Hemisphere, bordering two nuclear powers. And the treaty has been signed uh, in Semipalatinsk uh, in 2006. And uh, Svante Cornell mentioned already the low enriched uranium bank, that is operational in Kazakhstan. That's another important step on the road to strengthen the non-proliferation regime. And I would like to mention that in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, President Tokayev has uh, voiced another interesting initiative uh, to establish a special multilateral body, the International Agency for Biological Saf Safety, based uh, on the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention uh, 
that should be accountable to the UN Security Council. Uh, uh, Professor Starr mentioned the uh, Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures Initiative launched by President Nazarbayev in 92 at the United Nations. Uh, I would like to say that today, uh, this conference uh, unites 27 Asian countries, combined territory uh, covers about 90% about of Asian continent and uh, conference on interaction, confidence building measures uh, accounts for more than 50% of the world's GDP and two thirds of the global economic growth. So uh, we, uh, there is an expression uh, that was, uh, uh, well-known expression said by one of the politicians in Asia that countries in Asia sleep in one bed but see different dreams. So our idea was, uh, the president's idea was to create an organization uh, uh, that can bring together Asian countries similar to what Europeans have, the OEC. And now we are working hard to est establish a full-fledged organization for security and development in Asia. I also would like to say that uh, I personally was very much involved in uh, uh, Kazakhstan's chairmanship at the OECE. Uh, you know that in 2007 at the Madrid Ministerial, Kazakhstan won the bid uh, to become a chair of the OECE. And we hosted a very historic summit of the OECE in Astana in 2010, uh, which uh, uh, was, a, I, I would say, a breakthrough in the OEC uh, uh, history and uh, uh, 11 years before and after there were no summits, uh, the, uh, the OEC, and we hope there will, that the Kazakhstan president will be repeated again in the future. I, as a Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, in 2011, chaired the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and that was the beginning of the uh, Arab Spring we chaired this organization for 18 months, and that was, I must confess, a very difficult period for the organization. And I personally chaired eight ministerials in Jeddah, and uh, I think we, we, we learned a lot, and we gained a great experience uh, at this organization. And one of the achievements is the was the establishment of the Food Security Center in Kazakhstan under the auspices of the OIC. And finally, I want to say that uh, uh, we know that uh, successful foreign policy is often based on stable and consistent domestic policy. So under President Tokayev uh, today, uh, Kazakhstan embarked on a very unprecedented reform, political reform process. President Tokayev said that without political reform, there will be no progress in economic reforms. And uh, uh, the multi-party system, increased political competition, civic engagements, uh, all these processes are irreversible and evolutionary in nature. And I would like to say that uh, Kazakhstan is moving into the right directions. We're looking forward to deepen and expand our experience. And I would like to take this opportunity once again to thank the authors of the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you, and, and what, a, what a pleasure it is for me to, um, uh, to join uh, these three gentlemen uh, on the stage. Um, I have, uh, over the years, benefited so much um, from the, the intellectual power and also um, uh, the friendships. Um, I, I would uh, strongly recommend this, uh, this report uh, to the audience. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we see a report like this uh, come out online and we uh, put it on our bookshelf or file it on our computer and think that it'll be a good reference material for a, a later speech or a later paper. Uh, this one's different. Uh, this is a, a really good read. Um, and uh, it's great that uh, we're meeting on Friday because I would really encourage you to, uh, to carve out a, an hour or so this week and uh, you, you will be glad you did so. It's, it's, a, it's a good read. It's a good reminder of history. And as you just heard uh, Svante talk about some of the, uh, the things pointing uh, forward. So it's a, it's a handsome, handsome report. Um, you know, Kazakhstan, uh, we always, uh, in, in, in the US government, we, we, we tend to look towards countries as either um, consumers of security 
and stability or as exporters, producers of security and stability. Um, we think about the, the Soviet Union uh, coming to a close in, the, in a Cold War ending and the way it's reported on largely is it was a, a peaceful conclusion and obviously relative to the, uh, the terms of what the Cold War could have meant if it turned hot, it was very peaceful. But if we look at the former Soviet republics at the point of um, the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the last 25 years, uh, Kazakhstan's uh, stability and security is, is really a, quite an outlier. We look at the Caucasus and, and Azerbaijan and Armenia and Georgia and, and not, not much more needs to be said there. We look at Moldova, Ukraine, and then back into to Central Asia. Uh, you can look at the civil war in Tajikistan, the instability in the Kyrgyz Republic, and obviously the, the, the instability and conflict that's, that's taking place in the Fergana Valley. Um, so Kazakhstan has been a, uh, an exporter, um, a producer of, of security and stability. And, and that really goes to um, the, the wisdom and the uh, strategic vision of, of uh, President uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev and um, the, the multi-vector foreign policy um, that was pursued and, and continually uh, pursued now by President Tokayev. Um, obviously, uh, Turkmenistan uh, in their permanent uh, positive neutrality uh, can't point to uh, what Svante mentioned, which is their enhanced sovereignty um, because they play a positive role for countries uh, like Russia. Uh, so it's a very, very positive thing. I want to just not repeat what's already been said about the report because I'm, I'm encouraging you guys to read it. Uh, but just talk about a couple things that, that I thought of after, after reading the report, some opportunities and, and some challenges. Um, again, uh, with, uh, with geography, um, I, I agree with Svante that, that, that Kazakhstan's uh, sovereignty has been enhanced by the role that they have played in, in, in uh, the last uh, several uh, years. And, and uh, quite some time ago, a, a Kazakh foreign minister said to me that we're just a, a flea between two elephants, Russia and China. And obviously no one uh, describes Kazakhstan as a, as a flea today. Um, but if you think about competition that may come between Russia and China, it's probably going to come first in Central Asia. And this will be a challenge for, for Kazakhstan uh, to, to deal with and something that will be very uh, difficult and uh, to, to manage and something that that uh, calculating and um, uh, how much you bring in the, the West and, and how you balance uh, the rising power of China and and the uh, um, uh, yesterday's power of, of Russia will be something that, that they'll really need to focus on. I think a cottage industry can be made about talking about Turkey uh, these days, especially Turkey's relationship um, with the Gulf and Turkey's relationship with, with Russia. Uh, relative to Russia, it's been described uh, as frenemies. Uh, it's been talked about as compartmentalizing relations. Uh, people have pointed to uh, where they're on the same side or on different sides in Nagorno-Karabakh, Libya, Syria, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. And, and obviously they, they, they both have an interest in somewhat frustrating um, uh, US leadership uh, there are times when, when they um, uh, are, are being able to manage their, their competing interests, something that, that Moscow is not always uh, best at. Sometimes people suggest that Moscow looks at another country either as an enemy or a vassal. Um, so I think that, that, that Turkey will be uh, uh, something that, that uh, Kazakhstan's experience will be of, of great benefit um, uh, really in, in, uh, in the Middle East and, and, and elsewhere. I, I think that um, uh, right away, uh, something in the, in the Gulf region is that um, Kazakhstan, because of its uh, uh, role as the ambassador mentioned um, as a majority a Muslim country and one that's, that's chaired uh, the uh, Conference of Islamic Organization um, and it has positive relations uh, with the Gulf Emirates as well as with Turkey, uh, this is something that I think that Kazakhstan may uh, really kind of uh, play a, a positive role in, in the future, uh, trying to less the, lessen the tension and, and work on the relationships there as, as well as with, um, 
with, with Israel. Uh, finally, um, I've never quite understood the, um, the conference on um, confidence building in Asia. Um, uh, I, I, I admire the vision, um, but uh, it is a collection of, of countries that as the ambassador said, does have different dreams, even though they, they share the same bed. Um, I think it'll be a challenge to, to move it to an organization. Um, a, a dialogue is one thing, an organization is, is something quite different. And that really points towards um, capacity building. Kazakhstan has benefited greatly um, by the, uh, the expertise of its diplomats. Uh, Erjan is a, is a prime example that we benefit from uh, having him in, in Washington. Um, but I, I, I think that there's going to be a, a, a great deal of um, in, increased requirements uh, if this moves to an organization and moves to an organization that the members find uh, of value. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 maybe I would like to uh, uh, maybe ask Fred to, uh, if you want to comment uh, briefly about other presentations, Fred, and uh, then uh, we'll move. I have a couple of questions to ask. Uh, as well, Fred? <clears throat> Not a question, but an, an observation. That is that the diplomacy of Kazakhstan, it represents a, a, a really remarkable merging of national interest and, and appropriate personalities. Uh, if you had just one and not the other, you wouldn't have had the results that we've been discussing today. Uh, and, and, and this is very important. And I, I certainly agree with Svante Cornell's assessment of, of Mr. Takayev. He, he, is, he is not unique, but a rare figure on the international scene whose, whose background is so overwhelmingly on, on exactly the affairs and concerns in the international sphere that, uh, that the mediation project has focused upon. So uh, I, think, I think I'm left rather optimistic about the future. Uh, and, and, and I would also underscore, underscore the point which Svante Cornell made and which the ambassador was too polite to make himself. And that is that there's strong bench strength in the diplomatic uh, 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 side of the uh, government of Kazakhstan. The, 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 there are very capable people. I have to say, uh, I, there are very capable people in the, in the diplomatic side of, of, of just about all of the new countries in Central Asia and the Caucasus, people with real experience, real knowledge, and, and serious, serious capabilities. This leaves me thinking that, that maybe there is a stronger regional dimension of this in the future than has been the case so far. Yes, we have the Caucasus effort. Yes, we have the, the effort in, in Tajikistan was very early, the effort in, in 2010 in Kyrgyzstan. But it seems to me that one could talk in the future of, of people, like-minded people, people who, who, who are by temperament mediators uh, in all the countries of Central Asia, uh, linking arms on specific issues uh, that, that may be possible to do even more uh, collectively in that role uh, than, than, they have, than Kazakhstan has achieved, which is so impressive uh, on its own. Uh, the, re the reality is, is that uh, partnership in this area, as in all others, is always a plus. Thank you, Fred. Uh, there is a question, probably it may go to all the speakers. Swante uh, mentioned about uh, uh, the, uh, how uh, Kazakhstan's role may be comforting to some of the, uh, some of the actors in international affairs. Uh, the question is about uh, how different major powers look at Kazakhstan's effort uh, in, in, the, in this uh, international mediation. Uh, there are, uh, David mentioned a couple of actors like Turkey and, uh, and, uh, and Russia, but 
uh, question is, what are the uh, perceptions of other uh, major powers in general, including Western countries and Kazakhstan's role in, uh, in the international mediation? Question to anyone who wants to answer. If I am to try to take a stab at that, I, I would say that we have seen during the past 10 years uh, quite significant examples of how the world has reacted to Kazakhstan's initiatives. I think the OSCE presidency was one example. David can probably speak uh, much more about that, but um, the, uh, there were, from, from the side of Western countries, there were of course some that, uh, that, that had concerns about Kazakhstan's role because of the issues of democracy and human rights. Um, but nevertheless, Kazakhstan managed to uh, overcome those concerned and those objections and was unanimously elected to be the president of the OSC. Uh, and later we saw how Kazakhstan garnered fairly significant support for its, uh, for its ambition to have a, uh, a non-permanent seat at the UN Security Council. I think those are examples of, if you will, the legitimacy Kazakhstan has built in international affairs. Um, it seems to me that the, uh, it depends a little bit of where you look at it from, from, from your, um, your vantage point, so to speak, and the level of understanding of Central Asian affairs. It seems to me that both in the US and in Europe, there's still a tendency to view this in the, in, in the, through the prism of the chessboard. The chessboard where the local countries are just pawns and you have the great powers that are, you know, moving chessboards on the chess pieces on the board and, and there a lack of differentiation perhaps between the, uh, the countries of the region. Uh, now, I'm not saying that is something everywhere, but you still see remnants of this idea that dates back to the 1990s when all the countries in the region were relatively weak and, and in need of foreign assistance. Uh, today, reality is very different and you have a bifurcation in the region between countries that are still weak and dependent on foreign support, both in security and in economic terms. Uh, on the other hand, you have countries that have really built a solid foundation. And it seems to me that what we've seen over the past decade is that at least in Asia, there is a greater realization of Central Asia's role and the agency, if you will, of Central Asian countries. And then of course, in particular, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, as we can see from the visits to law, the, 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 uh, the tours really of the region taken by Prime Minister Modi of India, as well as the Korean president and, and the Japanese prime minister among many others. And I think that suggests that there is, oh, and also in, to, to, a, to a certain degree also in the West, a growing realization that we, in Central Asia, we don't only have countries that are potential problems, but we have, as, as you mentioned previously, David, the, uh, the uh, producers in, of security and net contributors of security. If, if I could, David, please. Thank you very much. Um, I think that, you know, Kazakhstan diplomats uh, don't shoot from the hip. Um, they, they arrive well briefed, well prepared. Um, they, they have taken seriously their role on the OSCE um, as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. Um, they're, they're imaginative. Uh, they take advantage of, of uh, you know, roles, uh, counterterrorism roles within the U UN. Uh, so, so they they are punching above their weight already, um, and, and there's confidence there's confidence in them um, because they they see. I'm sorry. There's confidence in them because because they appreciate and 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 recognize the the role of international organizations. Uh, Svante and Fred's report also pointed out um, how important. Uh, the, the individual is and how a part of Kazakhstan's mediation was the international reputation of Nursultan Nazarbayev and, and gave different reasons why uh, we should expect this to continue with the international reputation of President Takayev. Uh, there's a lot there and, and just uh, one board that I was meeting with uh, I described Takayev as as uh, as you know, kind of George Herbert Walker Bush. That that um, George Bush was a UN ambassador. Takayev was the head of the international organizations in Geneva. Bush was an ambassador or an envoy in China. 
Takayev was foreign minister. Bush was vice president, Takayev was prime minister. Uh, so he's a well-known commodity and, and one should expect that, that uh, Kazakhstan will continue to play this, this oversized punching above their weight in, 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 in internationally. May I offer a, a comment and a question? Sure. Uh, we've been talking about mediation on the in the international sphere. But I, I note that when President Takayev came to office, one of his early steps was really a mediating council uh, of, of citizens. Now, uh, you can argue for or against that and its effectiveness, but the fact is this was, I think fairly clearly, an effort to apply domestically the same principles of mediation that we've been discussing here this morning. Now, Change is difficult. It's difficult everywhere. We, there, we, no one has any illusions about that. Rapid change is, is even more difficult. It, cre it creates totally unexpected problems. Uh, it will for Kazakhstan, uh, as it will for every other country. The question I would ask is whether the same techniques and methods can successfully be applied to uh, uh, in the domestic scene? And if so, how might it be done? Ambassador, you want to answer the question? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I, I, want to, I want to say a few words um, about the role of the personality in history. Uh, in fact, I had the privilege of serving as a foreign affairs advisor to the President Nazarbayev uh, for several years, and uh, I it was a great experience for me, and uh, I think that uh, given uh, uh, the fact that uh, Nazarbayev uh, is a heavyweight uh, politician in, in the region, to a large extent, uh, many of those achievements were uh, possible because of his, uh, of his support and of his uh, political weight. Uh, he is a person who uh, witnessed the turmoils and hardships of uh, the problems uh, before the break of the Soviet Union and after the break of the Soviet Union. And he was witnessing so many uh, fires around Kazakhstan. So one of his goal and main goal was how to create conducive external conditions for stable and sustainable development of Kazakhstan. And, um, and I, uh, answering to the question of uh, Professor Starr, I mentioned in my remarks earlier that uh, 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 foreign policy is the continuation of the domestic policy. And uh, we certainly believe that Kazakhstan cannot be successful in uh, uh, conducting its foreign policy initiatives without having stable and consistent uh, domestic policy. So that is why it is uh, uh, commendable that President Tokayev uh, initiated this uh, very uh, robust uh, political modernization reform process in Kazakhstan. And we hope uh, uh, it, will it will continue definitely. And uh, the important thing that we are moving into the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. One, uh, maybe uh, let's go uh, maybe around all speakers and uh, just uh, we have like five minutes left. Maybe each of you will speak one minute. Uh, uh, where you see future going and what needs to be done, let's say next, um, Swante alluded a little bit about this, but next maybe decade or two to uh, um, continue this, uh, this policies and this strategy of, of, of Kazakhstan of international mediation and in general strengthening through this process, obviously uh, not just the sovereignty of the country, but the international standing of this uh, and position, strategic position of Kazakhstan. So Fred, shall we start with you? One minute. I, I would wonder that might not make sense within Kazakhstan and the educational system to uh, have, a, have a program, have, a, have a, an, an initiative, have writings that explain how potential conflicts in any sphere, in domestic sphere, in one's private life can be often be ameliorated through, through mediation. Yeah, uh, this is this is a, a, very, a very big topic, it, it, and it's worth 
applying it in the in the domestic sphere and applying it in the, in the sphere of education. Uh, in this area, Kazakhstan has a story to tell, and it's worth it, it's worth doing so uh, in, in a forward-looking way, not just patting themselves on the back for past deeds, but but suggesting how the same mentality can be applied to, to, to domestic political conflicts and conflicts of social or religious nature on the domestic sphere. In, a, in other words, strengthening uh, intellectual capacity for mediation, both external and internal issues. Ambassador. Yeah, and I want to add what just said, uh, Professor Fred Starr said is that uh, you remember that Kazakhstan uh, launched a very uh, ambitious program in 90, at the beginning of 90s. We, we, we call it Bolashak program, which translates as a future. So over the period of 25 years, uh, country managed to uh, train more than 20,000 students uh, in top 100 uh, universities abroad. Many of those graduates of those universities uh, today serve as a uh, occupy a very important uh, uh, positions in the government. Uh, uh, few of them are ministers. Uh, we have governors in the region, and uh, they also represent uh, quite a strong uh, uh, civil service uh, uh, contingent uh, uh, in, in, in our government. So I think that the fact that they saw the world, they, they know uh, how the world works, it will bring more interesting initiatives. It will bring more interesting, positive results uh, at the international international emanating from Kazakhstan. Thank you. Thank you. Swante, please. Well, uh, I think aside from what Professor Starr and Ambassador Kazakhan have mentioned, it seems to me that the, the, uh, the reality of Kazakhstan and Central Asia is on the one hand, that we see geopolitically speaking, um, it is increasingly stuck within the, if you will, uh, the framework of the relationships between the surrounding powers. Uh, the role of the West remains somewhat unclear. Uh, we saw, for example, in the uh, recent Armenia-Azerbaijan war, how uh, Russia and Turkey took the lead role, but the role of the United States and Europe, uh, although both were represented supposedly in the negotiation formats was rather minimal, I would say. Um, that said, uh, it, me, while the geopolitics of the region are such that the roles of Russia, China, Iran, India, Pakistan, Turkey are, are the perhaps most uh, uh, immediate concerns for the region, simultaneously we see how Central Asian states, and as, uh, as Ambassador Kazakhanov has mentioned, uh, President Tokayev specifically is trying to embark on serious domestic reforms, whereas the surrounding great powers are not exactly the type of forces you would expect to be either very interested in this type of systemic reforms or be able to really help in, uh, in these reforms. The only real area from which Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and hopefully all the other Central Asian states can get assistance, technical assistance, uh, advice, um, is to look at the experience of uh, Eastern European countries and other Western countries that have gone through these type of reforms. Uh, similarly, when we look at the efforts of bringing about regional cooperation in Central Asia, it's the same story. The supporters of regional cooperation are not really the immediate neighbors. They, they are not invested in, in this regional cooperation, whereas Europe and the United States have, a much, have voiced much greater uh, support for it. So it seems to me, that for this to be able to, for Kazakhstan's international role to be able to continue in this, in this fashion, it requires that its domestic stability through reforms is also successful and that Central Asia as a region functions as a region. And therefore it, it, it would seem to me that it would be very important for the US, uh, irrespective of which administration is in, in power to continue to engage with Central Asia uh, in a way that it frankly has not always done in the past 30 years. Thank you, thank you, Sante. David, last word. So not to uh, so not to uh, repeat what my colleagues have said. <clears throat> I, I liked what Swante said with regard to the role different Scandinavian countries, countries of, of vast size and small populations, um, have have played, and and 
played to increase the uh, stability and to um, raise their uh, reputation in the international uh, scene. Uh, I think as the center of gravity uh, moves from Europe to Asia, uh, Kazakhstan is well placed uh, to, to play such a role, to continue to play such a role. I think that um, uh, some capacity building as far as, uh, you know, Fred and I are, are uh, members of the board of Nazarbayev University, kind of a continuation of that Balashek program where we've partnered up with those types of universities. Um, but but uh, to try and have some research and, and convening power uh, where some real great leaders um, can come and, and, and speak there and get uh, Kazakhstan a little bit more on the, on the map uh, or add elements to the Astana Club uh, to do the same thing. And then final word, uh, I, I'll end where I started, which is just a really encouragement uh, to read the, re the report and, and hats off uh, to the authors. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, thanks to all uh, our speakers uh, for uh, your uh, participation and uh, uh, contribution. Definitely thanks to audience who was watching uh, us uh, on uh, online and uh, we'll, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, we'll continue our, our effort to promote um, countries of Cent uh, Central Asia, their achievements, uh, both in international uh, relations as well as their domestic development. There was a question about Kazakhstan's economy and we plan to host event on uh, regional uh, economic outlook uh, before end of the year with IMF representatives, our traditional meeting where we will be discussing uh, economic developments in the region uh, as well. But thank you again for your participation. Thanks ambassador for hosting my colleagues there. And uh, thank you, David, for your contribution in discussion. And we are looking forward to our uh, next discussion and we'll be posting uh, obviously uh, announcements about events on online and on our website. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.